Hi, hi everybody. Thanks for coming to that session. Uh, when I started learning about Docker two years ago and I started digging into it, uh, really one of the best resources I found were uh, Jérôme's presentation at the time uh, to learn about uh, what was like C groups and namespaces and how you play with that. So today we have a, uh, another session in depth with uh, Jérôme Petazzoni from Docker uh, about uh, um, namespaces, C groups, and uh, what containers are made from. Hola, Barcelona. Como estás? That's what I know in Spanish, so I will have to continue in English. But I made a point when I go to some place to start speaking a little bit in the local language, even if it's just to say, hello, I'm Jerome and I don't speak your language, I'm sorry. I did that in Russia when Andre, that you saw just before, invited me there, so I had to learn a few words of Russian. That was hard. So I'm here to talk about containers and what they are made from. Namespaces, C groups, a little bit of copy and write. Yes. So short intro uh, for those who don't me yet. So I'm Jerome, I work for Docker. I'm based in the Docker HQ in San Francisco. Um, and I was uh, lucky enough to be with Docker before it was Docker. So I have like five, six years of experience with a project that is only two and a half years old. That's very convenient. So when I have recruiters calling me, hey, we're looking for someone with five years of Docker experience. I say, yeah, I can do that, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> So I was part of the team who, that built .cloud, the past that we had and eventually became Docker. Uh, and I also, I'm a member of the House of Bash. We have a few members. Jessie is also a member of the House of Bash, even if she doesn't know about it. So we put things in containers and we replace people with tiny uh, shell scripts. That's what we do. Um, so <clears throat> the outline for today. First, I will have a really quick thing about what's a container. I guess that most of you know about containers, but I just want to make sure we are on the same page. Then I will talk about those container building blocks. So namespaces, C groups, copy and writes. Then I will talk about different container runtimes. Some that are based on C groups and namespaces and other that are not based on those things. And uh, finally, we will do uh, a little bit of crazy demos because no talk would be complete with those some crazy demos. So first, uh, what is a container? So, you know, like there is this high level approach where we say, well, a container is a little bit like a lightweight virtual machine. And then we also say, well, but a container is not a lightweight virtual machine. Stop thinking that because that puts you in the wrong mindset. But when you really don't know, it gives you a little idea of what to expect. It feels like a VM, like you could get a shell into it, you could SSH into it, but don't. Uh, you can have your own process thing, so when you do PS, stop, htop, you only see your own processes. You do IF config or IP address, you only see your local network interface. So it really feels like a VM. You can, you can install uh, packages in it, you can run services, great. But at the same time, it's also more like chroot on steroids because it's not a VM. It's just a bunch of normal processes running on a normal kernel. And if you are on a machine that has Docker or another container runtime installed and you do PS, you will see all the processes inside uh, all the containers. So it's more transparent than a VM. You can't do stuff like having a different kernel for your container or having a different OS because it's only one kernel and, and then you uh, put little walls between the processes. Each process is living is in its nice little world where it can only see its own environment and not the rest of the machine. So how is it implemented? Uh, almost five years ago, a little bit after joining .cloud, I was starting to debug some problems and I wanted to understand how containers worked. So I took the best tool I had back then, uh, which means grep, and I started to look in the kernel source code. Okay, where is LXC? It's nowhere. There is no single reference to LXC in the whole Linux kernel. It's like, what? So you look for containers, then you have tons of things, but those containers are not the containers that you're looking for. Those containers are like SCPI containers. I have no idea what it is, but after a few hours looking on that, it's not those containers. Um, or you have containers like a list, so it's a kind of container like in data structures, but not the container we're looking for neither. So uh, at some point, I'm like, okay, do container really exist? 
Uh, and so after digging a little bit more, uh, I realized that I was looking in the wrong place. Containers are not in the kernel. What is in the kernel, however, is those famous uh, C groups and namespaces. So let's start with control groups. Control groups uh, let you implement metering and limiting on the resources used by processes. So you can uh, count the memory and limit it, do the same with CPU, with I.O., either block I.O. or network I.O. You can also set some kind of SEL kind of permission management on device nodes. Uh, and you can also uh, do what I call crowd control. I will explain what it is in a few slides. So some uh, big generalities about C groups. Uh, with C groups, each subsystem, so like CPU, memory, and so on and so on, has its own hierarchy, which looks like a tree with nodes, and each process belongs to one node in each hierarchy. So a given process will be in one node for the CPU thing, in one node for the memory thing, in one node for the block I.O. thing, and so on and so on. In the beginning, when the machine boots, you only have one node, so it's a tree of one node, and the first process is in the first node, so it looks like, it, it looks like there is nothing special. Which, by the way, means that even if you're not using containers on your machine, you still are in containers. Your, your whole machine is a container, with no limits and everything, but it's still in a container. So if you think you can go faster by like not being in containers, nope, because you're still in a container. Even when you're not in a container, you are in a container. That's how it works. All right. This is a little example with just like two hierarchies, CPU and memory. So you can have some things. So for instance, in CPU, we said we're going to have real-time jobs and then batch jobs. And for memory, we'll just have well, like one subcategory for databases. And then in each group, we can have more subgroups. And then the numbers are uh, PIDs. So that's a, a fictitious example. Now let's talk about those different C groups. So um, first, the memory C group. So as I said, we can do accounting. So we can count how much memory is used uh, by each process, or rather a group of processes. So we can keep track of every single memory page used by a group of process. Um, the granularity is a memory page, so it's not down to one byte at a time. It's a memory page of four kilobytes on, on most architectures. Uh, and those pages are sorted between different groups. Uh, so there is like file and anonymous. File pages are ones that you can track down to one specific location on disk. Like if there is somewhere, some, something on disk that corresponds to that page, because basically uh, that page, that memory page was loaded from disk, then it's counted as a disk page. And why is this important? Because if at some point you're like in a rush and you need some memory quick, you can remove that page because you know it's still on disk. So you don't have to swap it out. Now you have anonymous memory, which is not related to the Tor project that Jesse talked about this morning, um, but which is the memory that does not correspond to something on disk. Like when you do a malloc or like to, to simplify things, it will come from anonymous memory, which is a little bit more annoying when you want to reclaim that memory because you have to swap it out first. All right, and then uh, the kernel will put those two things in two pools. There is like active memory and inactive memory. It's completely arbitrary. It's not like, uh, oh, this is an active page, this is an inactive page. It's more like by default, we put everything into active. And then when we are kind of getting a little bit out of memory, then we start to put things into inactive almost arbitrarily. But each time you touch a page, it goes back to active. So it's a very simple mechanism that will put the pages that are accessed often into the active set and the ones that are not accessed often into the inactive set. Each page is charged, so to speak, uh, to, uh, to, to a group. When multiple uh, groups are using the same page, they don't exactly split the bill. That was changed some time ago. So basically, there is only one group that pays for the page. That means if you look at the memory usage of all the groups, OK, that page is accounted for that group. So in the other groups, the page is invisible. But if that group goes away because the process is terminated or something like that happens, then the, the cost is moved to another group. So when you have pages shared between groups, it's a little bit tricky. Now you can set limits. So each group can have its own individual limits or not. The limits are purely optional. And you have two kinds of limits, soft and hard. 
So the soft limits are not strictly enforced. In fact, I will first explain the hard limits because that's slightly easier. Hard limits is if you go above your hard limit, the process gets killed. Like the, maybe you see what, what happens when you're on a Linux machine and you're out of memory and then the out of memory killer um, triggers and it will just like randomly remove processes. Uh, and then people are like, oh, that's pretty bad because suddenly MySQL disappeared or that process disappeared because I was out of memory. Uh, so the hard limits for C groups will do that, but on the C group level, so no, now that means that if one specific container uh, goes out of memory, instead of randomly killing a process somewhere else, it killed the process in that container. Which, by the way, is why we say all the time, uh, put one service per container, try not to put multiple services in the same container. That way you can have a good granularity and you avoid the scenario where this process went away because this process was out of memory. Soft limits, so they are not enforced, so you can go above your soft limits just fine. So what's the point of soft limits? Is that when the memory pressure starts to be really strong, when the machine is like, okay, I'm, I need memory because soon I'll be out of memory and it will be really bad, then it will look at the, the processes, or rather the C groups, that are above their soft limit. And the more you are above your soft limit, and the, the most likely you are to get pages taken from you by the kernel. All right, you can also set those limits for different kinds of memory. You can set limits for the physical memory, so like physical RAM, but also total memory, so physical plus swap, and you can also set limits for kernel memory, so all like the uh, D entries and all the internal kernel structures, because at some point, yeah, we, we have limits for, uh, you know, resident size and uh, swap and everything, but one process could still use the kernel, well, abuse the kernel in ways that it would use lots of memory memory and that was bad. So now we can also set limits on that. So I talked about like the out of memory killer and so this improved uh, a lot. Now you can set an out of memory notification system so that when a container or a memory C group, technically speaking, is out of memory, instead of randomly killing something inside that C group, we can say, okay, let's stop all the things. So we kind of freeze uh, that C group and then you have a notification and the, a program can handle the notification and can decide between killing the container or maybe giving more memory because we have more memory right now or move the container to another machine. That's the kind of thing we can do. Some little details. Uh, so each time that the kernel gives a page to a container or reclaims a page from a container, it has to update those counters and that has a performance cost. So. Uh, this performance cost means that when this is enabled, uh, you have a little bit of performance hit on not exactly memory alloc and free, but more like this action of moving pages uh, between the free pool and the used pool, which is not exactly the same thing. So again, you can think, haha, I will not use containers because that way I don't have this overhead. No, no, this is a global thing set at boot time. And even if you don't use containers, if this is enabled, then uh, this operation will happen and you will pay this uh, overhead. This is one little unfortunate thing. It's not something you can set per C group. It's, uh, it's global on the whole machine. So you either boot with it or not, and then that's it. If you want to change it, you have to reboot. Next C group, the huge TLB C group. So who here knows about the huge pages? Well, yeah, a bunch of people, great. So you know what this is about. <laughs> so this is a way to limit the, the amount of memory uh, given by the huge TLBs in a, for, for, for processes. Because by default, a process can use all the TLB amount, all the huge pages uh, that, that he wants. Uh, that way, uh, we can have multiple processes using huge pages uh, and not one single one um, uncomparatively uh, eat everything. Now the CPU C group, so this lets us uh, track CPU usage, uh, but on the granularity of a whole C group. So that's a kind of an improvement over uh, just checking one single process. There are a lot of C group features that are here because when you want to track things, uh, you want to track a group of processes or a group of threads, and there are operations that you can do on a single process easily, but if you want to do them on a group of process, it's harder and sometimes even impossible. So this gives a super easy way to say, okay, I'm putting those processes here, and I, now I have a super easy way to track how much CPU usage uh, they uh, use from the machine. 
So you can set uh, weights as well, uh, but you can set limits, which is often extremely annoying the first time you're like, hey, I would like to limit uh, that group to 10% of CPU, but you can't. So you're like, why the F did they not implement that? The answer is because it doesn't make sense. So at first you're like, wait a minute, and of course it makes sense. When I run top, I see that I have something using 10% of CPU, so I just don't want it to go above 10%. No, it really doesn't make sense, trust me. Because if you are using only a small amount of CPU percentage and you have tons of like CPU cycles available, a modern, decent machine will slow down the CPU because save the planet and everything. So, yeah. So if you only use 10% of the CPU, the CPU slows down. And then if you want the same amount of CPU, you should use more. But then the CPU will speed up. And then that's kind of a mess. So you could say, OK, OK, let's count the number of cycles that a given uh, group is using. OK, maybe the percentage of CPU doesn't make sense. Fine. Let's count the, the cycles, number of instructions. That doesn't make sense neither, because most machines, either if done under the hood, they are risk machines. Outside, it's CISC, so some instructions, like loading something in a register, will be super fast. Some instructions, like taking something at the address indicated by a register, multiplying by the address, well, the content of something at the address of another register, and storing that at the address pointed by a third register. This is broken down into like half a dozen instructions, and that will be much slower. So, Counting number of instructions would not work neither. So, well, you can set uh, CPU usage in person. Um, next thing, the CPU set C group. So, CPU set allows you to pin uh, groups of processes uh, to one CPU or to a set of CPUs. Uh, and so, that lets you dedicate CPUs to specific tasks that allows you to, for instance, avoid processes that are constantly being moved to one CPU to the other. Like you can, if you want, you can dedicate a CPU to one specific process because it's super important that the latency is as best as possible. It's also great on NUMA systems, non-uniform memory architecture. That's when you have like multiple CPUs, well, multiple sockets, and you have a bunch of memories that, that just are kind of connected to a specific CPU each time. So when that CPU wants to tax the memory up there, it's slower because it has to go to the, the other CPUs. And in that case, it's like super convenient to be able to say, OK, this process or those processes will stay there on you know, this CPU and the memory that goes with it. Uh, that's, that's why, for instance, sometimes people are seeing stuff like, that's weird. I'm running this huge MySQL database server, and if I only have 60 gigs of RAM, it's super fast. But when I have 150 gigs, it's slower. That doesn't make sense. That's because of that kind of uh, NUMA considerations. Block I.O. So Block I.O. lets you uh, measure and limit uh, the amount of block I.O. done by uh, C groups and containers. So it will keep track of the I.O. for each group of, and per block device. It will keep track of reads versus writes and also synchronous versus asynchronous operations. Synchronous being when like, I'm, I'm doing this syscall and I'm getting the, the result right away. And asynchronous being basically uh, almost all writes because when you write, it goes to the page cache and later the kernel is like, okay, we have to write this thing. And, and then it's an asynchronous write. Which, by the way, means that if you uh, try to set a write limit, and then you try to write a file, you'll be like, that doesn't work. I said one megabyte per second, and I wrote 10 megabytes instantaneously, so that doesn't work. It did. It, it wrote the 10 megs in memory immediately, but then flushing those 10 megs to the block device will be done at one meg per second, but it will be done slower. So this is absolutely great and works wonderfully, uh, either if you are actually running VMs in your containers, because then the block layer will typically do direct I.O., or if you are doing direct I.O. yourself because you know what you're doing. But otherwise, setting write limits, um, that's a good way to have some surprises. So I.O. is not only a disk, there is also network. So here you have net CLS for classifier and net prior for priority. Um, and you, so here it's a little bit of a disappointment generally because people think that they will do echo one megabyte per second to this and I get a one megabyte per second limit in my container. That doesn't work like that. What you can do with those C groups is to tell the kernel to put a kind of a, 
a tag, a kind of mark on the traffic that comes from a specific container. And then you still have to use uh, TC, traffic control for instance, and queuing disciplines and things like that, uh, so that the traffic that has been marked in specific ways will be shaped accordingly. So you still have to do some extra work. Uh, next thing, device C group. So that one lets you control uh, which container can read or write on which device. Thanks to this C group, a random container uh, can't like open your uh, slash dev slash SDA disk device and randomly read and write, which would be pretty bad. Uh, this is used to uh, prevent the container from just screwing up everything on the machine. So generally what you want to do is to allow like the um, harmless devices like dev TTY, dev zero, dev null, Dev random is a little bit special because you might know that on a Linux machine, dev random is fed with entropy. Entropy happens when you have like random stuff happening, like uh, disk access, network access, thing that, you know, there is some a random element in the timing of that. So you gather some entropy. It means that if you're trying to generate strong random numbers with your machine, typically you will get like 100 bytes of random things and then it will stop and you will need to move the mouse, or if it's a remote server, um, try to do some disk I.O. or anything to refill that. So generally in a container, you might want to have a something here instead of dev random. That, that's a, a, a known problem for people doing crypto, and by crypto I mean not just encryption, but generating keys, for instance, in containers, is that you can quickly deplete dev random, and then you're like, well, that's weird, generating keys in containers takes a long time. No, it's not because you're in a container, that's because you end up with uh, thousands of uh, key being generated and depleting your entropy pool. There are some very interesting stuff you can do with the devices C group. You can expose uh, dev Neptune, so that, that's the thing uh, to make like virtual network interfaces often, often used by VPN stuff, so you can have a VPN client or server in a container super easily without polluting the network stack of the host. Uh, Fuse, so you can have custom file systems in containers. KVM, so you can have uh, VMs in containers and then it's like the, hey dog, I know you like containers, so I put like Docker in Docker, in a VM in Docker, yay. Um, and you can even expose like the uh, GPUs with um, uh, dev DRI and dev video, so you can do Bitcoin mining or any kind of uh, uh, GPU intensive application in containers. NVIDIA recently released a bunch of containers to, to make that easy, by the way. The freezer C group, so that's what I call earlier crowd control, because the freezer C group can say, okay, I have a container and I want to do the equivalent of a six stop to the whole container. I want to stop to freeze that container. So you might wonder, why do we need that? Can't, can't we just like do six stop on all the processes in the container? Well, we could, but that would be slightly different. Because if you want to do six stop, uh, a, a process cannot stop six stop, but uh, it can know that it has been stopped. And if you are p-tracing a process, it will, you, you, there will be some kind of uh, interferences between p-trace and between six stop six count. So f the, the freeze C group lets you work around that. That way you can freeze the whole container, then unfreeze it later, and that's great to do like job scheduling. Uh, that's also great to do process migration because you can freeze the whole container move it and then unfreeze and, and, and everything is fine and there is no side effect at all. Subtleties. So the first process that you create on the machine, so basically init or systemd, uh, is created uh, at the top node of each uh, C group and then when a new process is created, it's created in the same group as its parent process. If you want to move, so basically if you do nothing special, all the processes are in the same C group. But you can move processes around and it's extremely easy. Uh, you can do that to the pseudo file system, which is typically on CFS C group. And if you want to create a C group, like if you want to limit the memory of something, you just create a directory and then you echo the PID of the process that you want to limit uh, to the tasks special file there. That's all you have to do. So there is something I call the C group walls, uh, which is that uh, people think that this interface is not so great. So, and, and also, well, the, no, the real reason is that if you want to do stuff like I want to reserve one CPU for an application, 
uh, all the other users of that interface have to agree. Okay, CPU number three will be to that super fast Redis instance and nothing else has to use it. So by using a, a higher level interface, like you say, okay, every, everything will go through systemd or CG manager, then you can say uh, this CPU is reserved uh, and you can make sure that nobody else will be using it. Next big building block, namespaces. So C groups were about limiting what you can use, but like in quantity. Uh, namespace are limiting what you can view, uh, so it's more like a, uh, in, in, in quality, yeah. Quality versus quantity. Um, so there are multiple namespacers here as well, so PID, NET, MNT, UTS, IPC, IPC user, and Again, each process is in exactly one namespace of each kind. So a given process will be in that PID namespace and that other net namespace and this other MNT namespace and so on and so forth. Let's review them. So the PID namespace is the thing that will let a given um, process see only the other processes in its own PID namespace. Uh, and when you are in a PID namespace, there is a local PID1, uh, which is different from the PID1 the machine, obviously. But remember what I said earlier, uh, when you are in the machine, you can see the processes inside the containers, which means that when you are in a container, you can see PID1, and that PID1 in the container could be something else outside the container. So you end up with a process that actually have multiple PIDs depending on the level that you are in. And if you do containers in containers in containers in containers in containers, at each level you have a PID for this level. So that can be a little bit confusing. Um, the network namespace. The network namespace is the thing that lets each container have its own network resources, its own local host, its own ETH0, its own routing tables, its own IP table rules, its own IPVS routing things because IPVS has been network namespace aware for like five plus years, uh, its own sockets and everything. Uh, there is something really nice that you can move uh, an in, a network interface from one network namespace to the other. So you can create a network interface somewhere and then you can move it to another container. So you can have a container that sets up some VPN thing and then we move the, that VPN interface to another container if you want to. The typical use case for containers is to use the VETH uh, virtual interfaces so that two virtual interfaces that are just like connected with a crossover cable between them. And so you, you put one of those interfaces in the container and the other stays on the machine on the, on the bridge. Uh, and so you have a virtual switch inside your Docker machine or container host and then all the containers are connected to that switch. The MNT namespace, uh, so that's basically the thing that lets each uh, single container uh, be able to mount something but not have that something being visible in the other containers. Um, that's a few nice examples of that, or like if you want to have each user on the machine have their own slash TMP. Normally, slash TMP is global for the whole machine and it's a big security risk because when you create a temporary file, if someone is really smart, they could create it just before you and bad things could happen. Uh, if, you, if you're using MNT namespaces per user, each user has their own slash TMP and you reduce the security risk a lot. The UTS namespace, that's just the thing that lets a container have its own host name, so that's pretty simple. The IPC namespace, all right, so um, who knows about IPC here? Okay, still a few hands. Who cares about IPC? Oh, still a few people, okay, so I have to talk about it. Uh, so <laughs> that's the thing uh, that lets have IPC resources, so semaphores, uh, share memory, uh, message queues, because in the beginning that was not namespaced, so it means that one process, typically like Postgres up to nine point something was using uh, IPC resources, and so without the IPC namespace you could have like Postgres server uh, colliding, with, uh, colliding with resources from another, so now that's, that's safe. The user namespace, that's super interesting, uh, it allows to map UIDs. So basically you can be UID zero in your container, that's great, I'm root, I can do everything, but outside the container you're really user uh, one, two, three, four, and so you can't do anything. Uh, but as long as you are inside the container, it looks like you can do everything, and so everything kind of works. That is really great uh, for security improvements, 
but it's more in the line of usable security. Uh, remember what we said this morning during the keynote, uh, awesome security, okay, that's great, but if it's not usable, people will just work around it, uh, and they will put like uh, passwords on post-it notes because you ask them to put like 15 character passwords and nobody can remember a 15 character password except maybe Rainman, and even then I'm not sure. So, uh, username spaces is a lot about usable security, by letting you have, okay, you can be root inside the container, so everybody is like, oh my god, you're root in the container, that's terrible. But outside, you're not root, and that's just fine. So it's easy to use, because you don't have to deal with UIDs and remapping and everything, but outside, it's still safe. Um, user namespaces, so there are two ways to see that. I saw a security presentation a while ago, and uh, somebody said, well, those Docker people really suck. It's been like almost one and a half years since they said that user namespaces would provide good security, and they still don't have user namespaces. I'm going to give you another version, is that one and a half years ago, we knew that user namespaces would be a great security feature, but it just took a while for user namespaces to be really usable. Yeah, because as we started to get user namespaces into Docker, uh, people realized there were tons of security problems with user namespaces, so those problems had to be fixed first. So user namespaces just landed in Docker Experimental. Uh, please, if you are among those people that were completely worried when they saw that you had root in containers and everything, test Docker Experimental, uh, file bug reports, uh, talk to us, tell us what works, what doesn't. Uh, we need you to make sure that it lands to stable as soon as possible. If you don't test it, it will take longer than if you do. Namespace manipulation. So how do we deal with namespaces? Uh, basically, you create namespaces when you create a new process. When you create a new process, you give extra flags to say, I want this new process to be in new namespaces. And then the, the process has its own uh, things. Um, you can view kind of the namespaces of a process by looking in slash proc, slash PID number, slash NS. In this directory, you have pseudo files corresponding to the namespaces. So normally, when a process, like when the last process of a given namespace goes away, then all the namespaces go away too. Uh, but if you want, you can do bind mounts to retain a namespace. Like you say, okay, I have this network namespace, I'm setting up routes and everything, but I want to reuse it later. Uh, then you can do a bind mount, and even when the uh, when the container has gone away and there is like you freed up all the memory and everything, the kernel can retain a reference on that namespace, so you can reuse it later. Right, the last building block is copy and write, and here I'm going to be uh, really quick, uh, because copy and write could be a full 45 minute talk, and so I, I can't do a 45 minute talk within a 45 minute talk, except if we, if we do Inception, but I don't have the dream machines and everything, so we'll skip that. Um, copy and write is super important, and it took me a while to really realize that, but if you just take C groups and namespaces, you could say, okay, that's done, we have containers, we can go home, nope. Because one of the things that make containers really great is the fact that you can do docker run something and boom, you have your container almost instantly. And this is thanks to copy and write. You can do docker commit blah 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 or docker build and the build process can be super fast except if you're using device mapper but then maybe, well anyway. Uh, so copy and write was really essential for the adoption of docker and containers generally speaking and so that's why when you think about building blocks of containers, copy and write should be your mind as well. There are tons of options available, UFS, overlay, better FS, ZFS, device mapper, and so on and so on. If you want to know more about that, just look for a deep dive into Docker storage drivers and you will have a full talk on, on this topic. Other details, so something pretty important is orthogonality, which is that all those features can be used independently. So, like, if you, for some reason, you're like, I, I hate containers, I don't want to use them, well, first, I'm going to warn you, the next five years in computing are going to suck for you. But that being said, uh, if, if you say, I don't want to use containers, but I just want this memory C group thing, or this network C group, or this network namespace thing, that's just fine. If you want, you can cherry pick one of those single features and use it super easily. Like, you just write a few lines of shell or your favorite print language, and you can use those features without, like, having everything uh, coming with it. Some missing bits, so some things that I did not talk about but that are really important, capabilities. Capabilities are this uh, mechanism to break down root into multiple things because by default on Unix, either you root and you can do everything you want or you're not root and you can do nothing. 
With capabilities, you say, well, some things are more important than others, like the ability to uh, uh, load the kernel module, that's serious. The ability to bind to a network port below 1024, maybe not that critical. So with capabilities, we can break that down into multiple permission bits. And so here again, the idea is, OK, you are rooting the container, but we strip all the capabilities. And so you can't do any of the evil things that root could do if it were so inclined. But then you can re-enable some things like, hey, this container is going to have a VPN, so we're going to give it a capnet admin and stuff like that so that it can configure network interfaces, for instance. On the topic of security, SC-Linux and AppArmor, uh, well, if you want containers that actually contain, you need to use that. Uh, again, that would be a whole talk on the topic, and there will be a talk on security a little bit later, I think. Um, something really nice, until recently, if you wanted to do like custom security uh, with containers and Docker, it was mostly SC-Linux. Uh, until uh, Jesse wrote something called Bane, which lets you easily write custom AppArmor profiles. That's great, especially if your servers are on Ubuntu and you're like, well, I could use a Linux, but then on Ubuntu, that's going to really be tricky. Now you can uh, use that to generate profiles for your containers uh, if you want some really fine-grained permissions. All right. Container runtime. So here I want to talk not only about Docker. So by the way, everything I said up to now applies to uh, a bunch of container runtimes, not only Docker. So there are container runtimes that are based on C groups, C groups and namespaces, so including Docker, and then some others that are completely different. So those based on C groups and namespaces. Elixir, so it's one of the first ones. It started as a bunch of user lane tools. That's what I said, LXC is not in the kernel. LXC is a set of user lane tools that uh, leverage on C groups and namespaces. Uh, so the early versions of LXC, so that was great because it was, uh, at least it existed, so we could use it. You could create containers and it was super flexible, but it had no built-in support for copy and write, no easy way to move images around, like the equivalent of Docker push, Docker pull, uh, and you still need to really understand how things work and write container profiles and everything, everything, which was great for sysadmins, but terrible for developers, which is why a lot of sysadmins initially were like, do we really need Docker? Can't we just write 50 lines of configuration for which container? The answer is in the question, I think. <laughs> Next one, systemd and spawn. So that's something belonging to systemd. So the man page of systemd says it's for debugging, testing, and building, a little bit like chroot, but more powerful. It implements the container interface. I don't know what is the container interface, but in any way, systemd seems to be the only thing implementing it. Uh, so it positions itself at plumbing. Uh, but it's kind of weird, like recently, well, not that recently, but they added support for Docker images, but apparently the systemd developers are so afraid of Docker, they think it's like Beetlejuice, if you say Docker three times in the code base, then it will go boom, and rewrite itself in Go, because this was in the patch, it's like, instead of, they didn't want to put Docker in the code, so they put do, some command, ckr, here, that's for real. Uh, if anybody knows why, I really would like to know because that really provokes doubts on like their mental sanity or something. Anyway, the Docker engine, so we know what it is, a big daemon controlled by REST API, ton of features so you can build movie majors and everything. The first versions of Docker, for those of you who started Docker a while ago, know that it used to shell out to Elixir, and then eventually we wrote libcontainer to be able to run without Elixir. Uh, so some people said, okay, uh, Docker does way too many things. We want something smaller that we can kind of put into our own system. And that's how systems like uh, Rocket and RunC appeared. Uh, it's kind of, okay, let's get back to the basics. So the idea here, like if you take RunC, you, it's the Docker engine, but you remove the API, you remove the build system, you remove uh, a bunch of other things uh, until you only have the thing to run a container. So RunC uh, is using libcontainer, the same library as uh, the Docker engine. Uh, it just takes a bunch of files in the local uh, directory and it starts your container. And it has some very unique features that uh, Docker doesn't have yet, like live migration. Rocket has the same idea, but is, is built uh, on top of a different specification. But the key idea is, okay, I just want something to start my container and everything else, nope. 
So if you're like, okay, which one is the best? Well, obviously it's Docker. <laughs> but now joke on the side, if you're like thinking, okay, I have this workload where performance is really important, should I use this or that? Uh, well, under the hood, they all use the same kernel features, so there will be no difference at all. So you shouldn't think about like performance, but more about usability and what you need and how it will uh, integrate in the rest of your system. Now, there are also uh, runtimes that are not based on namespaces and C groups. Uh, so, OpenVZ, that, so that's also in Linux. It's older, it's uh, super robust, uh, security story solid, because like if you use Travis CI, you get root inside of OpenVZ containers and nobody ever managed to break out, so it should be pretty solid. Uh, it has tons of really cool features like uh, P-loop, which is like device mapper, but in a good way. Uh, checkpoint restore, so that you can do live migration of containers, uh, and so on and so on. And even though it's old, it's still maintained, still actively maintained, uh, and uh, there are features that are slowly trickling from OpenVZ to uh, the other containers. Now, outside of the Linux world, uh, jails and zones on FreeBSD and Solaris, so the, the, the key thing with OpenVZ, with jails, with zones, is that uh, the, the, the first concern was, okay, we want a container to securely run processes. So security was there from the beginning. However, orthogonality, like this thing of, I just want this feature, I just want this namespace, that was never a concern from those systems. Those systems were built uh, by or for people doing hosting. So if you are a hosting provider, that's great. If you are, there is some echo, uh, if you are not a hosting provider, if you are just a developer looking uh, for a container runtime, it's not so great because it will be uh, less flexible. Uh, for instance, the, 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 the proof is that if you're looking for the equivalent of Docker Run, Dash TI, Ubuntu, if you're using jails, zones, or OpenVZ, that's going to be way more complicated and way more uh, lines of codes. Building our own containers, so that's the demo part. First, uh, warning, uh, don't do this at home, you're likely to burn the carpet and make horrible things happen. Uh, this is not for production use, but we will actually build containers. So, okay, that's my shell, good, All right. All right, so I have a, an empty uh, better FS volume here, uh, and uh, we're going to make containers with that. So first, I'm going to make sure that my mount points are private, because otherwise when I'm going to do mounts in my containers, they will bleed out to the host system and that would be pretty bad. All right, now I'm going to create uh, directories for images and containers. And now I'm going to uh, create uh, uh, an, an Alpine image. Uh, Bitterestable create, yeah, that's better. And now I'm going to use Docker here just to get that base image, just to get a, a, a plain table of that image, just because I'm lazy. So docker run dash d alpine uh, true. Uh, and then I can use, uh, so I have a container here that has the alpine base image, and I'm going to use docker export. So that will give me a table of that container, and I'm going to unpack this inside the alpine image. All right, so now in Images Alpine, uh, I have a, a, a tiny container image that I can use. But before using it, I will make a snapshot using BetterFS. So I am, I'm not going to actually do anything in that image, but I will create a snapshot. So BetterFS, uh, yeah, subvol snapshot, Images Alpine, containers, Tupperware. Right, so now I have a Tupperware container, best container ever. Uh, and just to kind of uh, keep track of where we are, I will create a file here like this is Tupperware. And now if I look in the Tupperware image, yep, I have this file here that will let us know that we are in the container indeed. So I will do a little chroot. Um, right. So yep, I'm in this Alpine thing. I could do APK if I wanted, that's great. All right, so now I'm going to um, use namespaces. So I do unshare, dash dash mount, dash dash UTS, dash dash IPC, dash dash net, dash dash PAD, dash dash fork, so that like, okay, give me all the namespaces uh, except the user namespace. And okay, so it looks like nothing happened, uh, but really it did. Like if I do hostname 
Tupperware and then exec bash. Yep, I need my Tupperware container. Everybody can see even from the back? Yep, okay, cool. All right, so now I'm in the beginning of a container. It's not exactly a container yet, we just have namespaces. And if I do PS, I should only see the processes inside my container. And yep, I see that. But look, there is something weird. The PIDs are like not PID1. What's going on? So that's expected actually. That's because slash proc is still the slash proc of the system. So I still have the view of the system. And um, if I want, I could do uh, something like, uh, let's see, uh, let, look at this. PID of unshare. Okay, if I try to kill this process, it will tell me no such process because I'm in the namespace and that's PID doesn't exist in this namespace. But if I mount proc, if I mount proc and then I do PS, now I only see the processes inside. Okay, good. So let's remove this slash proc thing. So now I want to get into the file system of my container. So I'm going to go to betterfs containers Tupperware and I'm going to use pivot root. So uh, basically you read the man page of pivot root and it says you, okay, you have to create an old root directory and then you do pivot root from the thing that will be the new root to old root and it should work and then it doesn't and then you read the man page again and again, you're like, what the is going on? And you're like, okay, there is some completely undocumented thing which is that, the, that you should be uh, almost at the top of the file system hierarchy, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, fine, so we will use a bind mount to make that happen. Um, so I'm going to bind mount to, to well, to make a better FS container to aware that to transform that into a mount, and that works better if I don't typo. And then I will mount that to almost the top of the hierarchy. So by the way, those kind of little weird quirks explain why stuff like Elixir, Docker, and everything is not easy. It's because there are a ton of little funny things like that all over the place. All right, now I can go to slash betterfs. So that's my Tupperware container. Fine, and now I can do pivot root dot all root. Okay. Uh, uh, so right, let's let's finish the job. So I'm in my Tupperware container. Let's mount proc. And uh, now if I do ps, yep, all is good. Uh, and now, if I do mount, I still have tons of mounts from the host system, so we have to get rid of that. So I'm going to do unmount everything, okay. But it also removes slash proc, so let's remount proc again. Uh, right, and I still have old root, I have to get rid of it, so I can try a moon, but it says it's busy, so here again I have to use a magic flag to say, hey, let's mount like do a lazy unmount. Right, now it's clean, we have something that looks like a container, that's great, uh, and uh, we could do something like, uh, you know, install something in the container. Uh, so let's see if we have network. Well, obviously not. We are in a container with a new network namespace, so we don't have no network. So we need to go to the host, um, okay. And in the host, uh, I'm going to uh, find the PID of my container. And I'm going to create uh, a pair of virtual network interfaces. So uh, the container PID is 6902, okay. So I'm going to do, okay, IP link add uh, H6902, type VTH, peer name six, uh, C6902. So now I have a pair of interfaces, so I will move one of them to the container, so IP link, so just to see what's happening here. If I do uh, IF config, I just have hello and it's down. Now I do IP link, set C um, PID netns CPID, uh, right, typos all over the way. And now if I do this again, okay, my interface just showed up in the container. See how easy it was, that's super convenient. Um, <laughs> really. Then I'm going to take the other interface, like the, the one that is still in my machine, and I'm going to put it in the Docker bridge. So here, I didn't go through all the way of creating the bridge and so on and so forth, I'm just reusing. Uh, okay, so what did I forget here? IP link set, uh, yeah. 
all right. Um, and now I'm going to go to the container, and in the container I will set up the network. IP link set hello up. IP link set, so C6902, I will call it ETH0, all right, and I will give it uh, an IP address, so uh, I'm just picking like a random address in the in Docker range. Uh, okay, good, and then I'm adding a default route. Uh, all right, and now if I do this, that should have worked, so I'm wired on the, no, I'm not wired on the network, so I might be tempted to blind the Wi-Fi, but that would be really crappy, so let's just make sure that it's not another IP address somewhere. Uh, can I at least ping my, um, yeah, I probably forgot something, so my interface is up here. Uh, And here, yep, I have a main interface, and it's still, and it's up, so that's good. Um, what's the address of my Docker interface? Uh, that's, yep. Right, I can ping my Docker machine, but I can go out, so let's check. Yeah, so that should have worked. If it doesn't, uh, let me double check my address, uh, 172.17.42.3. Yeah, I might need an extra IP tables rule or something. I'm almost out of time, so the last step I want to show here is that, and that's one, the, the important part is that if you know the Alpine image, you know that it, there is no bash in it. There is just like the basic SH. But here in my container, I'm still running bash. And that's one of the really important bits when you are setting up your own containers, is that the last step, uh, the very last step before really like handing off control to the container is to do this chroot slash sh. And when I do that, probably with exec, uh, then I'm really in the container. Before doing that, I was still running bash uh, which is not installed in the container, that's really important, and there is a kind of complicated handoff that has to happen uh, between your container runtime and your container, because all those operations, like the manual stuff I was doing here, okay, IP this, IP that, and so on and so forth, this is done by the container runtime, and so it doesn't need cooperation from the things inside the container. Uh, so that's the one of the, um, uh, the, the really important bits, and that's one also one of the complicated things uh, that um, that Docker and other runtimes are doing. Um, I won't go all the way to show like C groups and everything because we are out of time. But just to give you a list of the things that we haven't touched in in the demo, so C groups, uh, devices like this container, it could access to DevSDA and corrupt the whole disk if you wanted to. Capabilities. SC Linux or Apar more, uh, and a bunch of other li little things, including automating all that stuff. So what I wanted to show here is that, yeah, if we want to, just with bash and like maybe 20 lines of scripting, we can do our own containers. But just because we can do it doesn't mean that we should do it. And if you think, oh, we will do our own container runtime, I strongly advise you against it. And uh, Andre, who was speaking just before me, the first time we met, he told me, okay, I've seen the Docker early project. It was like 0.5, like more than two years ago. And the, the Yandex team was about to build their own container runtime. And they came to the conclusion that it would be less work uh, to take this Docker project and just use it for their needs rather than re-implementing uh, that from scratch. So if the Google of Russia prefers to use a, a container engine developed by a team of 10 engineers on the other side of the world, maybe you can too, especially after two years. That's all I got, and we can maybe answer a couple of questions uh, before the next session. Thank you. Hi, a quick question. Maybe you can tell a couple of uh, sentences about the new SecComp integration and whether it's going to be possible to put your own SecComp profiles. So what about the SecComp integration? Yes, uh, and the extensibility of it. 
Uh, Jesse has an open pull request for that, so I haven't seen it yet because I know it's super recent, but I recommend to go to one of her talks and ask her directly. She will be able to tell you exactly. Yeah. If you have a question, like wave your arms so we can see you, and otherwise it's no going once, going twice. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.